Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Linda Sarsour and I am the co-founder and executive director of Empower Change. And I'm also uh, serving on behalf of uh, Empower Change on the No Muslim Ban Ever Coalition. This is a coalition of organizations um, from across the movement who have been working uh, for many years uh, to not only repeal uh, the Muslim ban that was announced by former President Donald Trump, but also to ensure that any repeal is actually implemented um, in our communities. And so I am honored to be joined by incredible human beings who have been working on this um, for the past uh, few years. And so folks know that today it's been, a, it's been one year since uh, President Joe Biden um, rescinded the bans uh, and families continue to be separated. Um, it was basically ink to paper without a true implementation plan. Uh, today we'll be talking about the barriers um, that communities are still facing, what steps the Biden administration can take to remove those barriers, what the com community impact is, and what actions you can take at home to reunite families. First, we're going to start with some remarks um, from allies in Congress, and you know we uh, fortunately have had many on this particular issue. Uh, so Representative Chu was not was unable to join us today. Um, for this live stream uh, event, but she has sent us a video for us to share. As many of you know, Congressman Judy Chu uh, is currently representing California's 27th Congressional District, and the Congresswoman has been a strong champion in the fight against the Muslim and African ban, from mobilizing to the airports uh, when the Muslim ban was first enacted, to sponsoring the No Ban Act, which she pushed to pass through the House of Representatives last year. Uh, Judy Chu has been an ally to our communities um, in the kind of post 9-11 era, so her fight against the Muslim ban is not her first uh, rodeo when it comes to supporting and standing in solidarity with our Muslim and African communities. So Donna, can you please share the video with our viewers? Hello, I'm Congressmember Judy Chu, and I'm so happy to be a part of today's incredibly important panel discussion on the Muslim ban and its impact on our country. I want to thank the National Iranian American Council and the No Muslim Ban Ever campaign for not only organizing this panel today, but for your years of work to end this hateful ban. I will never forget that day in January, five years ago, when this ban was first announced. I was on my way to speak at an event when I received a frantic call letting me know that about 50 Muslims who held green cards were being detained at Los Angeles International Airport for hours with no end in sight. At that moment, I decided to drop everything and help in any way I could. I rushed over to LAX to advocate for these people. And once I arrived, I found out that indeed, there were scores of people with similar stories. People with a legal right to be here, kept for hours without food and blocked from receiving legal advice from an attorney. It was outrageous. And when I pressed Customs and Border Protection for answers, they resisted and blocked me. I even got them on the phone only to have them hang up on me. I'd never been more disrespected as a member of Congress. It was clear for those of us on the ground that this policy was poorly conceived and hastily executed. And moreover, that it was motivated by prejudice and started causing pain as soon as it was signed. That pain became increasingly clear over the years as more stories of separated families came out. And I did my part to help elevate these stories so that more Americans would understand the cruel impact this ban was having. That is why throughout Donald Trump's presidency, I invited multiple victims of the Muslim ban to be my guest at the State of the Union so that more people could hear their stories. People like Ismail Al-Ghazali, who joined me in 2020. Ismail is a U.S. citizen who works at a small neighborhood market in New York. In 2013, he married his wife, Hend, in Yemen. Hend applied for a visa to the U.S., but before her interview at the U.S. Embassy in Djibouti, Trump's hateful Muslim ban went into effect. Hend was eight months pregnant, and her pregnancy had been difficult. Doctors had discovered she had a heart condition. 
Ismail and Hand hoped this meant they would be granted a waiver to come to the U.S. and join her husband due to medical reasons. But after an interview that lasted just five minutes, Hand was denied a visa and left to give birth in Djibouti while Ismail had to return to the United States. Not long after, Hen gave birth to another daughter and Ismail was not able to meet his daughter for several months because of the ban. Fortunately, Ismail and his family were able to reunite eventually, but their story was a common one for far too many families who were needlessly separated by this ban. I've heard from so many who were forced to miss weddings, funerals, births, and graduations, events they can never make up. And that is why I was so thrilled that on his first day in office, President Biden rescinded all iterations of the Muslim ban. This was a huge relief to the thousands of families who've been separated by this cruel policy and to the many others who feared the anti-Muslim bigotry was inspiring. But we must make sure this cruelty does not happen again. That is why Senator Chris Coons of Delaware and I originally introduced the No Ban Act in the spring of 2019. This bill amends the Immigration and National Act to require that any future travel ban is based on credible facts and actual threats. The bill also requires the president to work in consultation with the Department of State and Homeland Security to provide evidence of why a ban is needed and to brief Congress within 48 hours of taking action. In other words, it requires policies to be based on facts, not fear. And I'm so proud that in April of last year, the House passed this bill by a vote of 218 to 208. Not only was I proud to strike a blow against religious bans, but I was proud that this was the first pro-Muslim civil rights bill ever voted on in the House. While I am pleased that President Biden's order means we put an end to the Muslim ban for now, that doesn't mean we put an end to the hurt it has caused. The truth is, there are still thousands of people who had applied for visas only to have them rejected because of the Muslim ban. And those people deserve to have the fair shot that was denied them. That is why I'm happy to know that President Biden's day one proclamation ending the Muslim ban also works to erase the harm done by ensuring that those who were denied visas are reconsidered and that they are not prejudiced against based on the previous denial. And I'm doing my part as a member of Congress as well, which is why I introduced H.R. 3548, the Keeping Our Promise Act. This legislation will officially undo the harm of the Muslim ban by requiring the Secretary of State to reissue the diversity visas that were not honored due to the Muslim ban. Winning the diversity visa lottery is a life-changing opportunity that many wait years for. To have it wiped out by this ban is inexcusable. But with this law, an estimated 36,000 people who were successful in the diversity visa lottery will be able to pick up where they left off. And another 39, 36 individuals will have their visas honored. This can and will make a huge difference in these lives. And I'm so thrilled that this bill already has an incredible 126 co-sponsors. Even more exciting, these provisions were included in the President's Build Back Better agenda that passed the House in November of last year. But none of this, whether ending the Muslim ban or keeping so much support for the Keeping Our Promise Act, could have happened without your hard work. So thank you again for your continued leadership and advocacy, and I'm proud to be working alongside you. So thank you so much to our Congresswoman. I'm trying to get back on my screen because I was sharing and I'm hoping everybody else here is sharing this broadcast right now on your own social medias because this is a very important conversation. So let me, um, I'm doing that on all the pages that I'm on right now. So give me one second here. 
because this is what we do. We're trying to multitask here. Uh, one second, here I am. Here, here we go, here we go, I'm back. So we are um, joined by an all-star group of folks. Um, many times when we think about these uh, kind of wins that we had, and while we're going to be discussing how the Muslim ban continues to impact our communities, we can't deny that the incredible organizing that has happened over the last five years um, has really helped us build morale and, and demonstrate the power that our communities truly have. And there's been some incredible folks um, that have spent many hours and many meetings and many Zooms um, and many hours in the streets, um, some in the courtrooms, um, some in the policy field, making sure that uh, this issue became front and center. So I am proud to be joined by Hamad Alam. He's a staff attorney in the National Security and Civil Rights Program at Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus which is a core member of the No Muslim Ban Ever campaign. Hamad's work at the Asian Law Caucus focuses on advocacy re to repeal and address the harms stemming from the Muslim and African bans through litigation and uh, the, our coalition's work protecting Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian communities from government surveillance and policing and representing clients facing issues at the intersection of national security and immigration on immigrant rights. So thank you, Hamad, for being here. Ryan Costello joined the National Iranian American Council in 2013 as a policy fellow and currently serves as policy director. In his role, Ryan directs uh, NIAC's policy team in its work to influence policymakers, monitor legislation, conduct research and writing, and coordinate advocacy efforts on foreign policy immigration and civil rights. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Ramle Saheed is a mother, a believer and an activist committed to transformative justice and the promotion of human rights and dignity everywhere. She is the executive director of the Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans that many of us know as PANA. Uh, she is born in Mogadishu, Somalia um, and Ramle and her family fed the, fled the civil war torn country when she was only six years old. And as many of you know, she has had the direct experience um, of what it means to be a refugee and an immigrant here in this country and witnessing these things brought her to where she is now um, as she started the Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans. And it's an organization that really aims to bring local refugees into San Diego's political, cultural and economic mainstream. But Pana's work, of course, while uh, focused in San Diego has had um, impact uh, across the nation and the models that she has used. So we are very uh, honored to have her with us as well. So thank you everyone. Um, and thank you for being here today, but also for all the work that you continue to do. So I'm gonna start with you, Hamad, um, you know, knowing that, you know, everybody kind of got the news a year ago that the bans have been rescinded. Um, and that was of course, incredible news for our movements and communities, especially in light of the four years we spent under, under a horrific fascist administration. But what we do know now um, over the course of the, you know, since the rescindment is that there are still individuals who are not able to obtain visas. Um, and, and so from your kind of vantage point as an attorney and kind of following the, uh, the I guess the process um, since the rescindment of this uh, order, what, what are the barriers that you're seeing um, that is preventing people from obtaining these visas and being reunited with their families? Yeah, so Linda, in your opening remarks, you had mentioned that, um, although of course, we're very grateful for the repeal that came through on the first day that President Biden took office on January 20th last year, in, in reality and in, in all practical terms for a number of those, uh, the majority of those in fact, who were denied over the past four years uh, by obviously what was a xenophobic policy, um, it really was ink to paper. And in reality, it hasn't resulted in any sort of meaningful actual change or a change in their circumstances or um, their applications. Um, so, I mean, th there's mainly, there's plenty of barriers, but there's mainly three barriers that I'll highlight. Um, one is just a simple sort of um, barrier that all of us face, right? I mean, COVID and health issues. Um, Many of these individuals are actually looking to unify with family members, but many are actually elderly parents of U.S. citizens, permanent residents who are here. They're looking to take care of their loved ones. And in reality, it's actually pretty risky for them to, for instance, go and travel for in-person interviews. And that's one of the main things is that consulates have not been accommodating whatsoever, despite the fact that there's this pandemic raging around the world <clears throat> and health is at stake, uh, especially for many of the applicants. 
um, and they just haven't been accommodating. They've required in-person interviews instead. This presents a number of, of problems for particularly, for instance, Iranians who often have to go to, for instance, Yerevan um, for their in-person interviews. And in fact, I'll get into that a little bit later, but <clears throat> Iranians in particular are not even seeing much movement. I think Ryan can talk a little bit more about that. Yemenis are needing to travel to Djibouti. Um, there's a lot of those barriers and, and that comes with travel expenses and travel burdens, right? Logistical issues, financial issues. And the reality is the government just hasn't addressed those issues at all. The other is a very confusing and inconsistent process. So one example that I'll give you um, about this is that even though there was a new rule that was issued recently, <clears throat> that those who are immigrant visa applicants who were previously denied or reapplying, um, their fees, uh, they wouldn't have to repay fees. They're exempted from fees. But the reality is that before this, um, it wasn't actually clear whether they would have to pay fees or not. And even now, what we're seeing is that in the online processes that are established by the government and the National Visa Center, it's actually logistically impossible to apply without having to pay fees. So, I mean, in reality, the practical steps have not been taken following what the letter of the law is actually requiring, right? Um, and notwithstanding the fact that <clears throat> this new rule change doesn't even apply to non-immigrant visas at all. So those folks are not even covered um, and have not been covered at all. Um, and, and really many of them, um, I, think, I think the majority of applications are in fact for non-immigrant visas. Um, and then the last thing is, um, I think Representative Chu actually talked about this. And this is an example again of ink to paper, but in reality, we're not seeing the actual sort of um, directive being carried out. Is that the fact of prior denial under the xenophobic ban, which the administration agrees was really ill-advised policy, uh, consular officers are actually regarding that as a negative factor when people are reapplying. I mean, this is entirely unjust, right? I mean, the fact that you have uh, an immigration policy that you agree uh, was xenophobic, uh, was, was ill-advised, um, and that you've actually repealed. And in fact, Biden's January 20th order expressly states that there should be a plan to ensure that prior denials do not prejudice, quote unquote, applicants. Reports are that consular officers continue to just completely ignore that directive and actually do, in fact, regard that prior denial as a negative factor. Um, so these are disturbing facts that are coming out in practicality. We can say what we want and we can read what we want, but the reality is very, very different for applicants um, who continue to face uh, a number of struggles. Thank you for that, Hamad. Um, just to kind of stay on the same kind of line, um, Ryan, um, especially as an organization uh, that uh, works to really advocate on behalf of Iranian Americans, uh, can you share a bit about, number one, some of those impacts that has specifically have has ha happened to Iranians? I mean, Iranian, for me, at least, I feel that the Iranian American community has kind of multiple layers of barriers um, in comparison to maybe some of the other uh, folks who are from different nationalities that were impacted by the ban. And then also, as you discussed that, if you can also um, uh, answer uh, just a bit about some of the changes we've seen in the visa processing numbers since Biden repealed the ban. Well, thanks, Linda. And Hamad really got us started well. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to barriers, you're looking at the consular issue that the, the consulates are not operating at full capacity with the pandemic. Uh, you've got crushing sanctions on Iranians right now that's near, you know, 45, 50 percent inflation. So, you know, we're dealing with inflation here in the United States, but it's nothing on the same level. So their money today is not worth what it was yesterday, which makes travel outside the country to get a visa appointment extremely difficult. And then you have to even travel to the United States after that if you're successful, which isn't guaranteed. You know, I think Biden, you know, he started off well, he repealed the ban, but we really haven't seen that relief come up. So, you know, the opening months is very much kind of Trump numbers, uh, you know, when it came to visa processing and so forth. And if you dive into them, you see, you know, for Iranians in Biden's first year, uh, back in 2016, there were 23,000 uh, visitor visas processed, the B1, B2 visitor visas. Uh, so, you know, what you would do to, you know, reunite with family, attend a wedding, uh, you know, see your family that you haven't seen in years. Uh, it went from 23,000 uh, in 2016, and Biden's first year, we only processed uh, 652 of those visas. So that's less than 3%, which is a huge number of families that aren't seeing relief, that aren't getting here, 
Uh, and, you know, it, it signifies that there's a ton of work to do uh, when it comes to getting back to some sort of level of normal uh, and just processing all these visas that are backed up for five years now. And that, you know, they were not prioritizing non-immigrant visas, the B1, B2, but, you know, the numbers extend beyond that. So you talk about family preference visas, immediate relative visas. Biden did, did not hit the same numbers that even Trump did in FY20 when it comes to those visas. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of work to do there. Diversity visas, I think, is really uh, a pretty shameful chapter here in Biden's first year. Uh, we had 106 processed in fiscal year 2020. Biden only exceeded that uh, to 193 in the whole year. Uh, and, uh, you know, that I, I asked a lawyer about this and, and, and he said that's because 150 of them came through court order. So without that court order, uh, you know, we aren't even exceeding Trump numbers on diversity visas. Now contrast that to 2016, we had 2,722 processed on Iranians, uh, you know, over the entire course of the year, which just one month exceeds the level that Biden did this year. The one bright spot I did find, uh, and I'll end on that bright spot, is student visas really did kick back up. So we had 3,139 processed in 2016. Biden basically got back up there, 3,001 in 2021. Uh, it had, even though this was supposed to be an area exempt from the ban, you know, cited in the Supreme Court and everything, uh, there were only 655 processed in 2020. So there was relief there. It shows that, you know, Biden can, you know, do the right thing and process visas, but uh, they, they really need to get their act together here to, to give relief to families. Thank you so much, Ryan, for that. And, and Ramla, I'd, I'd like to come to you. I think it's always important to have uh, folks who are kind of directly on the ground and really getting to touch in um, these families that uh, continue to be impacted. So I'd love for you to share a bit about um, some of the stories you've heard or any kind of experience that people, particularly those of the kind of communities you work with, who are either still not able to reunite with families or kind of other impacts by the, you know, non-rescindment of the rescindment or the non-process that came with the rescindment. That's right. <clears throat> Thank you, Linda. I think that's right. I think, you know, when we say the Muslim ban has been rescinded, um, you know, what does that actually mean for folks who were actually initially impacted and where are they today? Um, and then also it's really important to kind of reflect on like our country's immigration system was broken in the first place, right? Like if I tell my own story, my family was resettled um, in this country in 1993. At, the, at that time in San Diego and in the City Heights community where I still live, um, I grew up, you know, with a community that continued to welcome and receive large numbers of Ethiopian and Somali refugees. Um, while some of our families were really lucky enough to be reunited with family through family reunification um, and, and be reunited with siblings, grandparents, uncles, my family struggled to be reunited with, uh, with, with family. So I actually never got to meet my grandparents, for example. Our immigration, uh, and, and our, you know, it's important to remember that our immigration system was in that way already separating families. And the Muslim and African bands have only exasperated those challenges and made that, made it impossible for some of our families to be reunited. Um, I, you know, to tell one other story, there was a family that um, I supported when the first Muslim ban hit. It was a refugee family who had their flights posted. So they were really excited to come to San Diego and be reunited with family that they hadn't been, uh, seen in 20 odd years um and you know one of the you know one of the children actually ended up getting on a plane and arriving in san diego the, the day the band hit everyone else's flights got canceled right um so we scrambled uh, you know the first brand shouldn't have impacted people with already valid visas right but it impacted them their flights were canceled so figured it out they were able to get on another flight um, the flight posted, they were excited again, second band hits, canceled again, and five years later, this family separated, right? They're sort of stuck in a backlog, a back, black hole backlog, because the U.S. refugee um, admission system is pretty complicated. You have to go through multiple screenings and vetting processes, and those things expire after a certain time. So there are, there's an enormous number of people um, who who still feel the impact today? Who should have 
not been impacted in the first place. And because of procedural hurdles, because of these, you know, um, systems of, you know, checks that that expire, you know, you know, your security clearance is only good for so long, your health screening is only good for so long. Um, you know, what do you do? And I think that's kind of the next step of the Muslim ban being repealed is like, what what's the remedy for those folks? Um, and we don't have answers yet. Thank you, Romla, for sharing that. Um, and, that and, and that's and that what you shared is something that we're hearing across the country, from the East Coast to the West Coast, from the South to the North, um, to the Midwest. And so um, making sure that we're uplifting the actual people who continue to be impacted. I think a lot of time people think this is about policy and this is about paper and words, but it's actually people's lives. It's actually people not seeing parents and grandparents and being able to do the normal things that families do. So I appreciate you bringing in that. Um, I'm going to go back to you, Hamad, about, um, you know, what are some of the steps that the administration needs to take in order to remove these barriers? Like, we know who's in power here. We know that there are actually tangible things that can be done. And what are those things? What can the administration do? Yeah, so, um, you know, a lot of these are actually listed out in, in a letter that was issued to the Biden administration um, on the one-year mark of the repeal, um, simply because, again, as we've noted, um, for all practical intents and purposes, you know, a lot of families remain impacted. So you can see that letter on the No Muslim Ban Ever and I think uh, at NIAC's website as well. Um, I mean, the number one thing is really to provide clarity. Um, the January 20th, 2021 order that Biden issued which repealed the bans um, specifically directed the State Department to come up with processes and actually within 45 days issue a report um, we don't know what that report even looks like um, because it's sort of help being held in secrecy um, by the State Department. Um, but the department did issue a very scant statement. I think it was in early March of last year, following up on that review. And really, it, it actually caused more confusion than provided more clarity. Um, for one thing, it only addressed immigrant visa applicants with respect to whether or not they should reapply or, in fact, they'll be automatically reconsidered. And it actually only reconsidered uh, a subset of them. So for some reason, arbitrarily, a date was picked uh, of January 20th, 2020, a year before Biden was inaugurated. And anyone who was denied after that date um, as an immigrant visa applicant would somehow be reconsidered. But then again, no, de no further details were provided. Are they going to be notified by embassies? Um, are they going to be apprised of the sort of next steps that are involved? There was actually no detail whatsoever. And then it completely left hanging anyone who was denied for an immigrant visa application or non-immigrant visa applicants, um, regardless of whether or not, whether or when they were actually denied. Um, so that's one thing is that we just need clarity from the government. So practitioners are completely lost as to even how to help their clients. And really a lot of it is just sort of trying to see what sticks. Um, and each we're, we're hearing reports that each embassy operates differently. Sometimes you'll get a good consular officer who will you know, schedule an interview if you sort of try hard enough. Um, I mean, in our sort of system, that's just not good enough um, when we have regulations and processes in place that should really standardize things. Um, the second is immediately and automatically, um, you know, that's our demand, is, is, is that's our request, is to reconsider and reopen, and expedite, um, whether they're immigrant visa applications or non-immigrant visa applications, um, all of the applications that were subject to the Muslim African bans. Um, so from fiscal year 17 all the way to 20, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it, there should be no arbitrary gate or cutoff. Um, third is that, um, you know, don't require new fees. Um, we know that there has been a rule change, but again, um, there's some practical impediments uh, on, through the online application process uh, handled by the National Visa Center, um, and it doesn't even apply to non-immigrant visas. Um, Fourth, reimburse travel expenses um, for those who have been previously denied. Um, you know, that's that's a huge burden. I mean, some of these families really put in their collective savings just to get to the point where they can apply, where they can go uh, and actually attend these interviews. And then, moreover, even planning ahead um, for the big move that they're anticipating or that they're hoping for, um, because it's a big change in their life. Um, and lastly, um, you know, on the prior denials end, there needs to be clear guidance issued to consular officers to follow that executive order directive. Um, it's really important that that particular directive by the president and an executive order be followed 
um, and, and that clear guidance be issued to those consular officers. Seems like a lot the administration needs to do, but sounds like it's things that they can do, which is I think important that we're not actually asking them to do something that is not in fact in their power um, for them to do. Uh, Ryan, I, I think just kind of getting people to understand just even more about the technicalities, because again, if you are not someone who has had to go through these processes and these visa processes, you don't quite understand um, what it what it feels like. And I think an uh, interesting question would, you know, that I'd love for you to kind of talk about is um, what has been the impact on those who were rejected under the ban and what kind of, you know, if the administration doesn't do the things that Hamad says, like, what are the options that are available to them when it comes to getting a, a visa? Yeah, well, you know, one piece that came out just yesterday was a piece for, from uh, Rowida Abdelaziz at Huffington Post, and she chronicles like really well uh, the lingering impact of the ban. There are people who the ban was essentially the final act that they were, you know, entirely separated uh, from their family uh, until someone passed away. And so we're, we've gone through five years now of people being separated. That's a really long time, and we've only got... Uh, you know, so much time on this earth uh, to reunite with one another. Um, so uh, I think it's very difficult, uh, you know, the situation that, that people are in there, uh, you know, they, they don't have the certainty, as Hamad said, about what process to go through, how to, uh, you know, get their, you know, visa appointments, get their visas and, and come here. But, you know, kind of time's running out, you know, Biden's only guaranteed four years, one of those years is up. We're nowhere close to being where we were to the, the levels of processing that were happening in 2016. Uh, so, you know, time is of the essence here. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have all the answers right now. Ramla, I wanted to ask you actually something that we, we haven't talked about before, um, at least uh, not you and I personally, but you know, as we keep talking about family separation, um, we know that that's not just the concept that has kind of impacted our communities, but it's something we've heard over and over again, just in the larger sphere of the immigration debate, immigration conversation. Have you felt like our movements, um, both on the grassroots level and on the national level, have made that connection, that family separation also applies to the Muslim and African ban in the same way that we saw family separation apply to the border and the ways in which our government was like physically removing children from the parents? Like, do you feel like our movements over the last year since the rescindment have really paid attention to the current impact in our communities? Do you still think that, you know, we are kind of, uh, you know, back to square one explaining that Muslims are also immigrants, that Africans are also immigrants? <laughs> <laughs> that part, I think, you know, over the last, I want to say five, six years, there's been more of an intentional effort to, you know, think about what <clears throat> solidarity and action actually means and what it means to really think about our movements as um, connected movements. Uh, unfortunately, in practice, I, I, think, I think you're right, Linda, I don't know that in practice we're lifting up demands that connect these things. I think I still have to, I still find myself really talking about Muslims and African immigrants and Black immigrants immigrants and why they're important and why they should be <clears throat> a central voice within the IR movement, right? Immigrants rights movement um, and how these connections are, you know, they, they exist. Like we don't have to make these connections. They are, right? We are. Um, however, I think they're still, you know, it, it takes a long time to kind of shift from how we've, how we've been as movements the past 20 years or more to sort of, a, you know, a shift that requires all of us to kind of think about our demands, think about how we expand protections, how we think about how issues impact us like family separation, and then what it means to then reach out to, you know, organizations and people that are on the ground and working with particular populations and bringing in that work. It takes intentionality. It takes, you know, effort. Um, it, it takes planning. And sometimes I think we're so caught up in like the movement and, and you know, getting something out that we don't slow down enough to kind of be more intentional about bringing together, um, you know, a solid demand, a solid ask, um, even really thinking about legislation that could go just a bit further than that means, you know, uh, protecting includes Muslims, right? Protecting Muslims and their issues um, and that they are part of our community. And we should be thinking about that. But I think it's just one, you know, how do we find the balance to slow down 
um, to really be more thoughtful, to be uh, to take the time to reach out to folks on the ground who are working with these with the communities, right? Because we can't do everything, right? Like that's the other thing is organizations have to get out of the get out of themselves <laughs> and get out of their own way to really think that you know one organization can't do everything and so it has to be in partnership and allyship and true and true and a true commitment to like authentic relationship building and authentic um collaboration uh, that we're gonna you know make this shift but i think you know we're still learning as a movement i don't know linda if you <laughs> if you if you know you know if you agree or you know have other thoughts you want to share because i know you're in a lot of spaces Oh, I mean, I appreciate um, everything that you said, and it's definitely kind of this, I feel the same sentiments. I think we don't often talk about it because we're always kind of looking outside our movement and trying to figure out the outside. But sometimes what's more important is figuring out the inside and ensuring that as we talk about the Muslim and African bands, as we use terminology like family separation, that it actually impacts different Im immigrant communities in different ways. And I think our movements are still struggling to really articulate a vision um, of you know, dignity and, and human rights for all immigrants who are going to be impacted in different ways, depending on their context, their ethnicity, their nationality, the ways in which our government perceives that their countries of origin, our foreign policy in those countries of origin, you know, our there's so many factors. And I think oftentimes um, I, I, I struggle with our movements. I, 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 I feel that the intentionality is not always there. And I think that over the course of the last year, the people who've been on the front lines of continuing to uplift the Muslim ban and how it continues to impact Muslim, Muslim and African people have been led by the groups that whose constituency is um, still impacted by the ban versus having more allies who may, may be representing immigrants from other parts of the world who are impacted in different ways, not seeing kind of that same synergy that we saw when the ban was announced. Um, I think when the ban was announced, it was really a great way to see everybody it didn't matter what movement you were climate justice you were immigrant rights you were you know central american you were african and you know american and african immigrant i mean it, there was some sort of it was beautiful like it was just came together but i feel like we lost that a little bit over the way so i appreciate you kind of reaffirming Absolutely. um that and hoping you know to bring more people uh, along um Linda, can I mention one other yeah, thing that seems flagged for me? And, you know, that's the issue at the border right now. At the border, we have Somali brothers, we have Russian Muslims, we have, you know, uh, folks who are showing up, African um, African people who would have gone through the traditional refugee program, right? Like um, folks who are coming through the border who are African, who are Muslim, who are South Asian, and those narratives aren't being lifted up and represented in conversations about the border, for example. And that's a really clear example of how <clears throat> we aren't making these connections when we talk about like even our country's border and who's coming in and and how are folks impacted. We aren't telling that story that, you know, it, and another thing too, um, our deputy director, Hamaida, is leading our Afghan response. And right now, just actually last Monday, she visited, um, a, you know, a facility for unaccompanied minors. And guess what? There are African Muslim children. There are Afghan children who are un unaccompanied and no one's talking about that. And it was the first time these kids had seen someone who spoke their language, <laughs> who was wearing a khamar uh, or a scarf, <laughs> um, a hijab, um, who they could connect with. And that made them so happy, you know? And that's kind of what we're talking about is when we talk about unaccompanied minors, when we talk about the border, when we talk about immigration, it has to include everybody. And right now it just doesn't. Absolutely. And I just, I'm going to add one more thing to that. I went to do border relief work around the uh, crisis around Haitian migrants. Um, and so I went to Del Rio, uh, Texas, and I was able to go to some of the um, uh, centers that were kind of processing people outside of Del Rio. I'm getting them, you know, into other parts of the country where they had some sort of relative so they could wait for their asylum processes. And I myself was shocked. I mean, the majority of them absolutely at the time that I was there were Haitian migrants, but I also saw folks that were not Haitian. Um, I saw other black uh, immigrant migrants. Um, I actually, believe it or not, met um, Haitian Muslim migrants. Um, they also saw me with a hijab and they kind of were like, oh, Islam alaikum. I was like, going on here and there again it just shatters every stereotype we have of who immigrants are there are multiple identities that they have i also did see two south asian families 
Um, I saw folks that were telling me this crazy story about going through Carasau and, and it was just, a, everybody has a way of getting there and people obviously leverage this kind of mass mobilization of folks to the border. So you actually saw a predominantly black group mixed in with other folks and the other folks weren't the folks that we always think about, which are our more Central American sisters and brothers. So again, even we don't have the full picture of the diversity of folks that are coming to the U.S. border, the Mexican border as well, and don't get to talk about how we're not just the Muslim African band people. We come to this country in different ways, um, including uh, through the border. Um, I wanted to go uh, to you, Ryan, um, around, you know, there we, we a few times have mentioned here legislative efforts. Um, obviously, Congressman Chu started out with that around just kind of some of the stuff that's been kind of talked about in Congress. Um, are there, um, you know, you know, I think I know about some, but I think for folks that are watching today and hopefully as we share this uh, panel with um, our allies, uh, are there legislative efforts that are happening? And what do you think if, if, the, if these legislations were to be in fact um, passed and implemented, what would those, uh, you know, what would be the legal ramifications of that? How would that alleviate some of the harm that we've seen? Yeah, I think there are kind of two main buckets that we're tracking at NIAC. And one is kind of the Keeping Our Promise Act, which is for, you know, those selected for diversity visas, uh, mainly under the Trump administration, who weren't able to acquire them. So they got chosen for this once in a lifetime opportunity, you know, may have traveled through war zones, sold off possessions to get to this visa appointment. And then they're told, oh, wait, there's a ban in place. Uh, so you're rejected. Uh, which is really, you know, just astoundingly cruel. And uh, so the Keeping Our Promise Act would fix that. It got folded into two uh, pieces of legislation. One, the House Homeland Security Appropriation Bill last year. That just kind of got folded away. Uh, and then the Build Back Better Act, which, you know, got to this point where it's basically got 48 senators. You need 50 and it hasn't reached that. It looks like it's going to be broken up and, you know, sent, uh, you know, through a variety of different bills. Uh, so, you know, right now we're at a crossroads where we, the Biden administration, Congress, we need to figure out how do you get relief to this uh, group that we made this commitment to, uh, to come here and that was really, I think, treated really awfully uh, by our broken immigration system. The second one uh, I'll flag is the, the No Ban Act, uh, which I think we're all uh, pretty aware of. Uh, Judy Chu passed it through the House. It's gotten to the Senate. You know, right now we're at 43 co-sponsors um, and you need to get to 50 to have any, you know, hope uh, of getting to the finish line on this thing. And things do not look good for the midterm. So, uh, you know, I will shout out the, the senators here who are not on that bill. Uh, Chuck Schumer, I think he would get on if the, the rest of his caucus is on, but uh, Maggie Hassan, uh, Tester, Cinema, Mansion, Heinrich, Kelly, a mix of people you'd expect to be off it and, you know, a, a few of them who should uh, absolutely be on it. And, you know, I, I'm not sure what their excuse is here, but I think that's a, a key area for all of our groups to work on is to make sure, hey, you know, <laughs> you got to you, you gotta help us out here and, and make sure that the, the ban, uh, which you all opposed, uh, doesn't come back into force and the No Ban Act would do that. Very important. Um, Hamad, just, you know, I know that um, you all have been working on some cases um, and just trying to, of course, uh, uplift those cases, you know, more like from an advocacy perspective to kind of watch how that process goes. So what are you, what's your outlook on just some of the cases you've looked at, you know, you've worked on and, and, and kind of what your outlook is on them kind of moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think the main root of the problem, um, aside from sort of what we've already mentioned again, is is the lack of clarity and guidance that practitioners have. Um, I mean, and 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 not just that, but I mean, you're talking about um, I think over forty thousand applicants were denied over the course of the Muslim ban, and that's actually a conservative estimate number. Um, not all of them had lawyers; <laughs> they were navigating the process by themselves. I mean, lots of people. Um, as much as us lawyers would want to, to emphasize the fact that, hey, it's good to get assistance on this, uh, you know, obviously for, for practical purposes, financial purposes. Um, and also, I mean, sometimes it just appears easy. It's just a form, right? What, what could go wrong with this? Um, and so people would just take it upon themselves to sort of do that. Um, and, and the reality is we just, you know, don't have any real understanding um, of how to go about, um, you know, on a, on a sort of standard level across embassies 
trying to make sure that we can push this forward, trying to come up with a timeline, trying to come up with answers. I mean, you know, one of the main issues really is the fact that there's a massive backlog. So uh, the State Department um, has uh, actually come up with some numbers, I think. Um, they issue some numbers on this every month, basically, um, where the backlog is right now um, over 439,000 immigrant visa applicants, and that's just immigrant visa applicants, are still pending um, for the scheduling of an interview. Um, and only around 25,000 um, whose applications have been complete and, and sort of deemed um, eligible for interviews have actually been scheduled for the month of January. Um, so that, that's, that's thousands of applications right there um, that continue to be needing uh, interviews. And we just have no timeline. We have no guidance whatsoever. And there also hasn't been a prioritization. Um, so that's the, the very first thing. Um, I mean, I think the other thing is that, you know, the reality is that the Muslim ban was steeped in, um, you know, deep xenophobia, um, Islamophobia, and really kind of, um, you know, guised in sort of national security and foreign policy considerations. The reality is that the United States continues to exercise um, those types of foreign policy prerogatives that the administration has with respect to um, a number of folks who are who are who have been denied and who have been impacted by the Muslim ban in in, in, in a discriminatory fashion. Um, so you know, Ryan's mentioned some of the impacts around Iranian uh, Iranian individuals. Um, many of them reportedly who continue to remain in administrative processing, and there's been no responses whatsoever. Whereas, you know, others from other impacted countries, we've seen a little bit more movement with them. We've seen a little bit more clarity with them. Um, this might have to do with the local embassies where those applications are being considered, um, but it more likely has something to do with the foreign policy priorities of this administration at the same time, which is trying to sort of exercise its soft diplomatic power in these different ways through immigration enforcement and priorities, right? So um, I think that's, you know, some of the things that we've been seeing um, you know, again, the logistical issues, you can write things on paper, but in reality, if, you know, lawyers can help and lawyers can certainly, you know, email embassies, but a lot of these families, they face language impediments, they face, you know, sort of uh, lack of understanding of the process, um, and they just don't, and they're not even represented, so they just don't know how to go about it. Um, so really, that's what it's coming down to and what we're seeing. Um, and in particular, in particular, just a final thing that I'll note is that um, the government, um, you know, seems to be taking, you know, varied positions on the non-immigrant visa issue, um, where, you know, sometimes they'll say, um, yes, they should be reconsidered. Um, they've actually represented in litigation that they are being reconsidered, but, it, but have also represented in other communications um, at the same time that, you know, they're, 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 they're in a different sort of category. Um, so really, again, there's a lack um, of guidance. There's a lack of real sort of, um, and, and those are all statements made at public hearings uh, in court. Um, and, and, you know, th there's a lack of real clarity. There's a lack of real consistency on the part of the government. And that's the real main hurdle that we're seeing. Thank you, Hamad. I'm going to go back to you, Ryan, because you already started here, but I, I'm an organizer. Um, I'm not a policy person. I'm not a lawyer. Um, and so for me, what's important always is to give people things to do. Uh, so I know that you started out by saying, look, there's 47 co-sponsors of this bill. You know, one thing that we could do is check if your member of Congress is on it. And if they're not, that's one way to kind of feel like you could get engaged on this issue. Are there other things that you think people right now can be doing uh, to kind of support the efforts that have been um, put forth to call on this administration to do the right thing, to, you know, get them their house in order, um, maybe on, leg on the legislative front? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, making a big push here uh, to make sure that the diversity visa uh, provisions and Build Back Better are not lost in whatever way, shape and form the Build Back Better uh, agenda uh, moves forward in Congress, I think is really important. Frankly, you know, we've had conversations with some members of Congress who are supportive of Build Back Better and they didn't know it was in there. It's a huge bill. Uh, they're broadly supportive of diversity visas, but it's easy for something like this to kind of get lost in the mix. There are so many different priorities. There's so few avenues to pass things that we've really got to speak up and make sure that they know that this is a priority. And the same thing with the No Ban Act. You know, I think uh, there's a lot of immigration uh, demands here. There aren't a lot of uh, legislative pathways to victory here. And so, you know, I, I think at the bare minimum, we need to make sure that those seven senators 
uh, know that uh, we're going to be judging them based on whether they co-sponsor that bill uh, and that we're not going to be silent and that we want them to, to make the best effort possible to pass this and to you know, provide some safeguards because you know, we we're talking before this call, the Supreme Court isn't there to back us up. We already know that. It's actually gotten worse over the last uh, you know, year or so. Uh, so it's all about, you know, can the administration help us and can Congress help us? Right now, we've got both of those, you know, um, Democrats in office and both of those. And theoretically, they're supposed to be on our side. We need them to step up and actually deliver relief. And, you know, it's all about organizing through our different, you know, organizations and this coalition and, and making our voices heard. You know, and Rumla, I think for us, you know, as grassroots organizers that kind of have a lot of face time um, in the communities, you know, what do you what do we say to our people who say that we go from one administration to the next administration? You know, what what what's your message? You know, how do people stay inspired? How do you stay, you know, motivated? You know, how do you, you know, like like what are people supposed to be feeling right now? Yeah, no, I think you know, part of it is like heartbreak that you know um, that we you know, in 2022 um, are going through a global pandemic in addition to all the chaos that we were trying to fight back, right? Like, so I think there's there's time for grieving and just understanding and recognizing kind of what the moment and what we're going through and making sure that we're really checking in on each other right now, more important than ever is that direct, you know, building relationships with each other in terms of our neighbors, in terms of our communities, checking in on each other. I think Penn is doing a lot of work around mutual aid and just like being present, right? And being consistent with, with each other and for each other. I think we can't lose that, right? Um, in addition, I think um, we have to remember and keep remembering what we're fighting for. We're fighting for our families. We're fighting for our nation's soul. We're fighting for a better future for our children. I just gave birth to almost one year old, right? Like I want him to inherit a better world um, than we're in now. And I think those are the things that keep, give us hope and, and remind us about what it is that we're fighting for and what it is that we're doing. And, and to remain consistent and to stay on course, stay on the path, because these are not easy victories. These are not easy wins, right? And no one administration is going to be our savior, right? Like, so we have to be commit, committed to staying consistent in our demands and recognizing that whatever we win is vulnerable to the next administration. So we both got to fight for keeping what it is that we're winning, as well as like keeping our eye on the ball in terms of the kind of future we want to create for ourselves and being very clear and articulating that and fighting for that, right? Um, I think sometimes we get really stuck in you know, a strategy like protest movement, right? Like, and, and then people are like, is that it? We're fatigued. Like, no, there's so much to do. Um, and so stay connected to an organization. Um, I think that's really important. Showing up for a protest is not gonna, that's not the, that's not the tactic that's gonna save us, right? It's just one in a, a toolbox of so much that we have to do to, uh, create momentum, create awareness, and like build our build build the work that we need to do. But it is connecting to an organization that we believe in, that we are you know that we you know identify with, that we feel seen in, um, that we feel you know like we have a voice. Like that's where the work is actually being happening. That's the work that's happening, and that's where you can have the biggest impact is being connected to an organization in which you can actually help to work to create. The kind of strategy you want to see in the community uh, played out, um, actually have direct work in, in, in supporting other community members and getting involved. And that's also going to help you stay consistent and stay in the stay in the movement, right? Like, so don't be that individual who's just out there showing up by himself. Like get connected to an organization. That's that's what I have to say to, to all of us is that that's what's going to keep us consistent and it's going to keep giving us hope, right? It's like being in community with others who share the same commitment and values to our val to, to our communities, to our families, um, that remind us why we're in it in the first place, right? And so if you aren't connected to that group of people, that we're gonna, we're not gonna have a consistent movement and we're not gonna have the kind of accountability that we need to keep the pressure on, to keep these things um, um, from ever happening again, but also keeping the wins that we've already had, right? Like, so um, like, stay con stay consistent and the, the way to do that is to join an organization that you can that you believe in 
I'm selfish. I needed you to tell me that because I was feeling a little discouraged. This uh, started this new year out on a bad foot. So I was, uh, I needed that. And I just remembered I was wearing the shirt today. I got it from some organizers in North Las Vegas. And it says, we're all we got folks. Um, so we got to show up and fight for each other. I wanted to thank everybody um, who joined us today and our ex extremely incredible panelists. And to your point, Ramle, about joining organizations or learning more about the organizations who are on the front lines of issues impacting our communities, please follow the National Iranian American Council. You can find them on all social media platforms, very informative work. And we appreciate you, Ryan, for a lot of the uh, research that you do to help inform the way in which we talk about these issues um, outside of our community. So thank you for, for that. Um, Hamad Alam from the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus, um, and for all your work that you do representing um, our families in what I believe to be uh, cases that go beyond those individual families that really have ramifications um, on kind of legal ramifications across uh, the country um, as other people are also engaging in lawsuits um, and trying to find ways to defend and protect our families. So thank you to you, Hamad, and to all the work that the Asian American Advancing Justice and Asian Law Caucus does. And to you, Ramle, and for the partnership um, uh, of the, the partnership P partnership for the advancement of new Americans, PANA, because I always say it's PANA. A mouthful. Now. <laughs> it's a mouthful, but PANA. Um, and I'm um, excited that I get to see you um, next month or maybe the month after that in March and get to spend time with you and for all the wonderful work you do. And shout out to all the grassroots organizers in our community. Many of them are part of our field program uh, here at the No Muslim Band Ever Coalition, who have really helped us bring resources and information to the people on the ground and have been with us. Um, and this coalition since the beginning. So shout out to them. And uh, if you want to get more information kind of just on this entire campaign, but on all the work that has been done over the past couple of years, please go to the no Muslim band ever.com. And you will also get to see these wonderful organizations listed, as well as many of the um, articles, media, uh, some of the legislative efforts that have been happening, petitions to support and endorse the work of the coalition. Um, and we hope to see some changes. Um, and we hope to see you uh, on the streets or at least online organizing in 2022. So thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Oh, and you could also follow Empower Change because my organization is going to yell at me for not doing what I'm supposed to do. So M, M the letter M, Power Change. Um, we are also members of the No, no Muslim Man Ever Coalition um, and very proud of the work that we have all done together over the last few years. So thank you. Excellent. I appreciate Thanks, you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.